We've spent most of this series focusing on the broad strokes of an effective DaVinci wide gamut workflow. And that's for good reason. If we get these pieces right, we're way more than halfway home. If we get them wrong, there's virtually no recovering. But my favorite part of the grading process is what we're going to be discussing today. Those subtle nuances that can take a grade from good to great. So in this video, I'm gonna show you three of my favorite techniques for adding that extra bit of visual polish to your images. All right, guys, so we've done our homework and laid a really solid foundation with our color grade for this timeline that we've been working on for the last couple of installments in this DaVinci Wide Gamut Workflow series. So today our goal is going to be less about shaping the overall grade than about really sculpting those little fine details that can make a huge difference to the overall experience of the images. So I wanna talk you through three of the most common adjustments that I find myself making at this stage of a grade. And the first one is simply to shape light a little bit. So let's look at say shot number six over here and observe that while I'm pretty happy with where I've taken my grade in terms of the exposure and the balance and the ratio and those things that we've discussed in prior installments of the series, what I'd now like to do is shape the light a little bit. I would love to guide the eye down a bit more to my subject and to the other character as he enters frame right. So what I'm gonna do here is do a new serial window and then I'm gonna go to my power windows and I'm gonna use a circular power window and stretch my aspect out to 100, which is effectively going to turn it into a grad and place this up top, do something nice and soft. And then I'm just gonna expose down up in this area so that this source and these white ceiling tiles are catching my eye a bit less. And likewise, the sort of reflections coming off of the uh, wood paneled walls here are just being tamed in a bit and aren't calling attention to themselves quite so much. And to do this, I'm gonna use my trusty offset and just bring things down like so. And let's try bringing the window a bit further into frame like this. I wanna make sure I'm not coming too far down on my subject's head, but really the movement of his body is what's more important here than about any details in the face. He's got his back to us anyway. So I'm not super concerned about that, but I do wanna make sure I don't go too far for that reason. And oftentimes what you'll have to do here if you're working without an external reference monitor is go to your window shape here and just turn it off because you really can't assess what you're doing when it's on. So if we take a look at what we're netting out here, the goal is to make an adjustment that no one would know is on there unless they saw it turned off. And I think we're doing a really nice job now of shaping the light down in this area and gently guiding the eye down to the region that is more important. And in fact, I would like to do the exact same thing on the bottom. So I'm once again gonna do a new serial node and add a circular power window, or as I just did, I could simply hit option C to add a new serial node and a circular power window at the same time. I'm gonna set that aspect to 100 once more, and this time I wanna hit the floor, and once again, keep it nice and soft. Anytime you're shaping light with windows, you wanna go as soft as you can afford to because it's gonna ensure that those edges never make themselves known. And I'm gonna do the same thing, just grab my offset and bring things down a little bit. No need to go too far with either of these adjustments, but just these little nudges are gonna help guide the eye to the important region of the frame. And once again, I'm gonna to go to my window and turn it off so that I can actually meaningfully evaluate how things are going. And let's just scrub through the shot and see how this changes over time. Maybe I'll flip my window back on at this stage and see where both windows are living. If I look at this one and then at that one, and I think this is working fine as the shot travels. Another goal that I have in general is to create shapes that are broad enough and soft enough and general enough that I don't necessarily need to track them even if the camera is moving or the contents within the frame are moving. Of course, we can track a power window if we want to, but that adds time and more importantly, it adds the potential for a power window making itself known as we watch it change its position within the frame. So ideally, we would do a nice, big, broad, soft shape like we're doing with these two windows and if I turn this off once more and enable disable both at the same time this is such a value add it's such a simple little adjustment that I'm making to the frame that's really elevating things and taking this shot to the next level and again it's an adjustment that you would only miss if it wasn't there no one would ever be able to spot that we are shaping the light in this way because really all we're doing is collaborating with the cinematographer and the production team to refine what they did on the day that this image was gathered so this is the number one thing that I'm going to do when I 
time at this stage of my grades is just look for opportunities to shape light. And because of the way we've worked thus far, it won't surprise you to hear that I generally am gonna to wanna to work in a negative direction with my windows, because if I've properly exposed the most important things in my frame, as we talked about earlier in the series, then all that should remain is taking down things that are distracting from that properly exposed subject, as opposed to re-exposing that subject and pushing them up. So this is gonna work in a negative direction here, and that's generally gonna be my preference. And just because of the nature of the location in this particular timeline, in this particular short film, I know that I'm probably gonna be making these two adjustments, this topper and bottomer, quite a bit in this timeline. Anytime I'm seeing a piece of ceiling or I'm seeing this wall above the washers, I know I'm probably gonna to wanna to shape things in just a little bit. So actually before I move on from shot number six here, I'm gonna tap node number four and hit Command C to copy that node and keep it in my clipboard, keep it handy. That way, when I get to a shot such as shot eight, and I know that I wanna do the exact same thing, I can add a new serial node and I can hit Command V. And now I've got that window and all I have to do is turn my window back on and sort of adjust its position until it's in the right place for this particular shot. So this is the number one thing that I'm doing when I take this pass through my timeline of sort of refining things and really nuancing the fine details is just looking at opportunities to shape and sculpt the light with power windows. And again, generally working in a negative direction. Here's the next thing that I wanna show you guys that I'm often going to be playing with at this stage in the grade. Let's go back over here to shot number five for a moment and just look at where we are right now. Now in this shot, I don't necessarily need to add any shape to the frame. I think the light is naturally quite well shaped as is. However, I feel like the balance that I've landed on here in node number three, I might've gone just a hair too far in terms of where I began and where I have netted out here. I like what it's doing. I just wanna do a little bit less of it. So unlike in my initial balancing passes where I'm just going through in multiple laps like we discussed previously and continuing to refine my offset adjustment here, what I actually wanna do in this case is just say, hey, give me 80% of that. This looks pretty good. I just wanna take a little bit of overall energy off the adjustment, but I don't necessarily wanna to continue to freehand things because I like where this is resting. I just wanna scale the intensity in a linear fashion. A great trick for this is to go over to this key tab here and play with our key output gain, which is going to affect how opaque or transparent this particular node's adjustment is on the image. So if I take this key output gain to say 0.65, I'm now getting 65% of the full strength of this adjustment, but I haven't had to move my RGB balance around at all or worry about shifting things further green or further magenta than they might've been a moment ago. I'm just linearly scaling everything back by about 35%. And I might even find that that's too much and go up to 80%, for example. But this is something else that I'm gonna be paying close attention to at this stage in my grade. Every time I land on a shot, it's just looking at, okay, by now I know I'm gonna be pretty happy with the balance overall, but is it at the exact right strength or does it need to come back just a little bit? And if it does, this key output gain is a great way to accomplish it because you don't have to upset the balance you already have. You can just linearly scale the overall intensity back just by a couple of inches. And again, small adjustment that can make a huge difference to the overall impact of your grade when you really dial these details in. And the final thing I wanna talk about really has to do with paying attention to the overall palette of colors in my frame. So this shot here is actually a great example. If I look at my subject's face compared to these yellowish washing machines back here, they are rather adjacent in hue, so I'm not necessarily getting a ton of separation between my subject's skin and the background here. So I wanna play around with sweetening the hue of the washing machines a little bit just to see if I can get them a bit more separated from her skin tone here. Now, there are a number of different ways to do this, but we always wanna be seeking the cleanest and the simplest way to do it. And here in Resolve, that is probably going to be our hue versus hue curves. So I'm gonna go over to this section and I'm gonna drag a nice broad sample here on those washing machines so that I get a control point with a goalpost on either side. And you can see that very nicely correlates with this large tooth I'm seeing in the signal, which corresponds with these washing machines themselves. And I'm gonna take a very light touch here because a little can go a long way, but I'm gonna to try to rotate the hue of these washing machines just a bit counterclockwise. So you can see all I've done here is go about negative five degrees 
And I think that's probably plenty. If you want to really finesse it and you feel like things are a bit too touchy here in the graph, you can go down to this hue rotate field and work it that way and it'll be a bit more subtle. But you can see it's very easy to go too far. Like that's too far, that looks unnatural, that looks strange. But if we leave things right around that kind of minus four or minus five level that we had before, again, something you would never notice unless you saw me turn it off for you and you saw the before version of the image, but just this little tiny splash of it is really helping to separate the washing machines in the background from our character in the foreground. You can even see it here in the vector scope. We're starting much more adjacent. Here's roughly our skin. Here's those washing machines. And when I turn this on, I'm rotating that vector, kind of peeling it away from my subject. So it's a good adjustment to the shot to get a bit clearer of a visual priority going on in the frame. And this leads me to the last thing that I'm always thinking about at this stage in the grade, to a question that I'm always asking when I'm making these final little nuanced adjustments, which is this. Well, if this works here and I like it here, could it have a role to play as a macro level adjustment? What do I mean when I say that? Well, what I'm saying is if I copy this node number four for a moment and then I disable it here at the clip level, and then go over to my timeline level, where way back in the beginning of this series, we established an overall look, and then I prepend a node upstream of node number one by hitting Shift S. So I've now got a serial node immediately prior to my main look, and I hit Command V. I've now got the same operation happening not only on this shot, but on every shot in the timeline. And if I start thumbing through the timeline and looking at the results of this operation on all of these different shots, I'm really liking what I'm seeing because this is going to consistently accomplish that goal that I had here in shot number five of rotating the hue of these washing machines away from the hue of my character's skin and in doing so giving me a bit more separation. So that's a sort of final idea that I'm always keeping in mind at this stage is does this particular adjustment have a useful role to play as a macro level adjustment that's going to hit all of my shots in the same way. So these are just a couple of things that you can try out when you're taking your sort of victory lap or your final pass or your refinement pass through your timeline when you're toward the end of a grade, just looking for those little opportunities to shape light, to guide the eye toward what's important. Then looking for the opportunities to maybe scale back just a little bit on what you've done with your balancing without going overboard or without having to rebalance every single shot. And finally, looking at little hue sweetening adjustments like this, which might serve not only the shot you're getting that initial itch on, but maybe all of the shots in your timeline and helping to get an overall look that's even stronger, that's got even more of a defined and separated palette. So just a couple of ideas for you guys to think about. There are of course others you can think about and maybe the most important thing to consider at this stage is we're not at a point where you're obligated to do anything at all. If I land on a shot and I love where my exposure, where my ratio, where my balance is living, and I love the overall look that I'm seeing, I'm not obligated to do anything further than what I've already done. In fact, that would be the ideal for me. That would mean that I've done a really good job up to this point, and I'm good to go without needing to get into any more fine details. However, you're often gonna find these little subtle impulses and itches if you take this final lap here and pay attention and apply the concepts that I'm talking about. And finally, I just wanna point out in passing two of the things that we have not done in this final refinement pass that you often hear talked about in color grading workflows. The first is to use power windows in a positive direction, so to window things and bring them up. And we talked about that. The reason why we're generally not going to do this in this workflow is because we have already sweetened the exposure on the important things in the frame. So we really should only be left with taking things away as opposed to building things up. And the second thing that you haven't seen me do here that I generally will not do when I'm in this final refinement stage is to pull qualifiers. Why? Qualifiers are a very narrow and very artifact prone adjustment. And my contention would be that if we've done our job well up until this point, we've got a good pipeline, we've got a good look, we've set our exposure, our ratio, and our balance properly, we really shouldn't need to be performing that level of invasive surgery on the image to get it into a good place. Now, there are always exceptions to this rule, but I would not consider pulling qualifiers to be 
a bread and butter adjustment that you'd want to make at this stage. I would focus on using power windows to shape the image and then I would focus on calibrating the intensity of my balance and finally on sweetening my hues and making fine adjustments to those things and contemplating whether or not those adjustments might have a beneficial role to play at the overall look level. So hope you guys have enjoyed this series on working in DaVinci Wide Gamut, which has really given us a great starting off point for talking about color grading in a color managed environment. And you're gonna find that everything that we've talked about throughout this series actually travels well, regardless of whether you're working in DaVinci Wide Gamut or in some other type of color managed workflow. You've now got the basics in place to implement a proper scene referred workflow where you are respecting the original negative, you're operating on it in its original state with its original dynamic range, and you're making more simple, broad, and photographic adjustments, and in doing so, getting the strongest possible image. Now that we've covered the essentials of working in DaVinci Wide Gamut, you may find that you have more questions than when we started. If so, great. Learning new things that provoke new questions is the exact cycle that we want to be in as growing colorists. But maybe the most important question that we can ask is, why? As I discuss in the final chapter of the Colorist 10 Commandments, this question will deepen your connection to your craft, reveal false assumptions, and lead you to unexpected insights. See you next time.